And so I just wanted to start out. If you guys want to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 5. We're going to go through 13. Matthew 8, 5 through 13. And it says, When Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him and asked for help. Lord, he said. That's an interesting statement. Lord, he said. My servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, Shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Take, I say to you that, that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then... Jesus said to the centurion, Go, let it be done just as you believed it would be. And his servant was healed at that moment. This is, this is stinking awesome. Everything about this is so cool. So, first, first of all, it's a centurion. He's a Roman soldier. He leads other Roman soldiers. And if you know anything about, um, about their military makeup, a centurion runs a small group of soldiers that essentially, if the battle lines get overtaken, these soldiers are so fierce that they fight to the death, absolutely fight to the death. And he runs a group of men that will do what he says, when he says, where he says, how he says, no matter what. That's, that's who a centurion is, an extreme warrior. The Romans were, they perfected warfare essentially. And this dude was, that's who he was. That was his role, okay? And then he says, he says something significant here. One, he says, Lord. This is, this is a Roman soldier. And he calls Jesus Lord. He's used to being the ruler. Yet he humbles himself and becomes, he becomes under the authority of Jesus because he recognizes Jesus' authority. And then he says, I do not deserve for you to even come to my house. Who here has felt that? Every one of us, right? Every one of us have felt like, I don't deserve to have Jesus come to my house. Whenever you do something, you sin, it's like, it's like you have to drag yourself to ask God for forgiveness because you don't believe that you deserve it. That's what this dude is saying. And if you think about why he might not deserve it, they were vicious, and he knew everything about the things that he had done. If you've ever been in war, um, then you, you understand that there are things that you have to do in war sometimes that you would never do anywhere else, but you have to do it in war because it's your job. You're not proud of it. Other people glorify it and put it on TV, you know, and make movies about it, and people think it's cool, but whenever you're doing it, it's not cool. It just has to be done. And so he knows these things that he's done, right? He understands the things that he's done, and he doesn't believe that he deserves for Jesus to come to his house. So he just says, just say it, and it's going to be done. I know it's going to be done, because that's the way things work. And he understood that. He understood it intimately, so much so that Jesus didn't even pray he didn't go to his house. He didn't do anything. He just said, go home. It's done. Because of your faith and you trust me, that much is done. Just go home. It's finished. And it was finished. And it was done. Isn't that cool? So today, 
First, before I even get started, that's not even part of my message. Sorry. Um, before we get started, I do want to pray. I want each of you to think of a need that you have or a loved one that has a need. And I want you to understand that Jesus wants them to be healed today. He wants you to have the faith that when, when you ask for it, it's going to be done. It's going to be done because that's the way it works. I love that we serve in a church where we are open to the move of the Holy Spirit, where we allow God to do what God wants to do. He says, you will do these things and greater things you will do because the Holy Spirit, he's giving us this gift, right? So I want to pray for Scott right now that he will be completely healed, but I want you guys to pray for, if you want to pray for Scott, pray for Scott. If you have somebody else in your life that needs healed, pray for their healing and expect it to be done. Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and we thank you, God, that you are such an awesome and mighty God that, that you didn't even have to go to the centurion's house. But because he believed that you would, you did. And so, Lord, we stand on your promise today. We believe that you will heal, Scott, and all the other people that these people are praying for today, God. I pray that you will go before us, that you will meet them where they are, and that they will be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, I want to tell you a story, and, and some of you um, some of you may know this pastor. I heard it from him, so I'm kind of telling it secondhand. Um, you may know this story. If you do, just bear with me, because I'm sure that there's people in here that haven't. I'm going to redact names for the, for the purpose of the story, and you'll understand why. Um, but this pastor was talking, and he, he told this story, and it was about uh, some people that go to his church. A man and a woman, they were married, husband and wife, and they were taking a trip to Israel pre-COVID. Um, they were taking a trip to Israel, and uh, the woman's mother really wanted to go. She had never been to Israel. She wanted to go, so they took her along. They were going for the purpose of kind of ministry. Um, they were supposed to be meeting up with some people there, but at the same time, if you're going to Israel, I mean, that's, that is the holy land. That's what Jesus literally walked. He, he walked there. He talked there. Like, everything happened there, you know? And I want to go desperately bad, so bad. So if any of you are going and you want to take me, please take me. Take my wife, too, because if you took me and not her, um, you might not want to bring me back because it could get bad. But, so, they go to Israel, right? And uh, while they're over there, they're doing their stuff, this pastor gets a phone call. And they had been out sightseeing and everything. Well, the mother-in-law got sick. And um, unfortunately, while she was there, she actually passed away. So that's kind of a, a bad deal, right? Overseas, different country, not so great. Well, the man, he called, he called the pastor, told him what was up. And the pastor said, well, um, I have some connections over there. And he gets a hold of a rabbi and... And he tells him what's going on, asks the rabbi to get a hold of the guy. The rabbi gets a hold of him and, and is talking with him about everything and says, listen, I know, unfortunately, you're, uh, you got some tough decisions to make right now. You can, uh, you can pay like $3,500, $5,000, something crazy like that to ship her back home um, and be buried back home. Or if you want... Um, I can pull some strings, and she can be buried right here in Israel for $500. And he's like, oh, wow. Okay, well, let me talk to my wife. So he's talking to her, and they want to send her back home. And so he goes back, and he, he's talking to the rabbi and tells him, and the rabbi's like, this is the holy land. You know, like, I get it, but you you'd be saving a ton of money, and she could be buried here in the Holy Land. You know, like, that would be a huge honor. And he says, uh, he told the rabbi, he said, sir, I, I totally understand that, and I really, really, really appreciate everything that you've done for us. He says, but, um, you know, 2,000 years ago, somebody died here, and three days later, they came back from the dead, and I just can't take that chance. So, but anyway... All right, 
Sometimes you have to redeem yourself whenever you have really bad jokes. You know what I mean? So, the title of the message today is going to be called The Way. The Way. It has nothing to do with the, do the joke that I just told, um, but that's kind of an icebreaker, I guess. So, The Way. If you all remember, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was preaching on Resurrection Sunday, and I had put together a whole message, and then that night, the night before, I was supposed to give the message, God said, no, wipe it out. We're going a different direction. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, you know how much time I spend on this, God. And he's like, no, wipe it out. So when Scott got sick and couldn't preach, I already had a message, so... It was kind of a, kind of a, a win there. Um, I did modify it a little bit because this isn't Resurrection Sunday, but nevertheless, the way. Christianity, before it was actually called Christianity, was called the way. If you look in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, you can turn there or you can just listen either way. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priests and asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether man, woman, man or woman, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Isn't that interesting? That's interesting. So why is it called this? I touched on this a little bit. Two weeks ago, Rod touched on this last week, but if you want to turn to John 4, uh, 14, 6, you will see the answer of why it's called the way. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. In Acts 4, 12, it says, Salvation is found in no one else other than, um, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Jesus is the way. Christians follow the way. They follow Jesus. That is why I called this the way. So, I just read you a couple verses there that talks about Jesus being the way and that there is no other way under heaven by which somebody can be saved. Like I said two weeks ago, though, I said don't get hung up on the fact that there's only one way, but just rejoice that there is a way. There is a way to heaven. There is a way to the Savior. There is a way to be washed clean of your sins and to be forgiven. There is a way. People get so, so bound up in, well, there's, there's multiple ways to God. No, there's not. There's one. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. I'm actually not sorry. There's one way. Only one. So, I want to talk to you a little bit about inclusive versus exclusive. Inclusive versus exclusive. Every religion, no matter what they say, is exclusive. Is exclusive. They exclude people. Okay? I don't care if it's Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, agnostics, even atheists are exclusive. Can you believe in Jesus and be an atheist? No. So you're excluded, right? Like you have, you have all these, these um, movements these days that want every, everything to, to be inclusive. And so they push Christianity out. Every religion is exclusive. Everyone. Christianity, though, is the most inclusive and the least complex religion on the planet. I'll break it down for you. By the time we get done, I promise you'll agree with me. If you don't, you probably weren't listening or you just choose to not believe me. And that's fine. So, why is Christianity inclusive? Why is it so inclusive? And it, I'll tell you, it's the, it's the cornerstone of our, of our beliefs. It's John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will, anyone, whoever will believe in me, all you have to do is believe in me, and you will not perish but have everlasting life. Anyone can come to the Father. Anyone. 
If you believe in him, you can come to the Father. That's inclusive. You try to go to uh, Allah in, in the Muslim religion, and you believe in Jesus, you're going to be killed. That's just, I'm sorry, but that is the truth of the matter. Whosoever will. If any of you ever listen to other pastors, Pastor Robert Morris from Gateway Church down in Texas, he taught a great message on whosoever will. That's the name of the teaching, whosoever will. I strongly recommend you go look it up and, and watch it because... It is so insightful. It breaks down so much more than what I'm going to get into today. So much more. But one of the great things about Christianity is you don't have to do anything to be a Christian other than believe in the one who's already done everything for you. Done everything for you. Given everything for you. You just have to believe in him. And once you believe in him, He's going to start changing your life. People are like, well, you have to do this. You have to do this. You have to do this. No, you have to believe. And then he's going to do all of this in you. And it's oftentimes just a process. He doesn't hit you with everything that needs to be corrected all at once because we wouldn't be able to deal with that. I wouldn't be able to deal with it. I couldn't deal with it. God's still working on me on so many different things. And honestly, I believe he will until the day that he calls me home. But he works on me. I don't work on me. I work on loving him, and he works on me. That's just the way it is. That's Christianity. That is following the way. So, you get questions. You hear, you hear people say, well, what about people who lived before Jesus? Or what about people who didn't get to hear about Jesus? What about these people? Well, I'm going to break that down for you, but in order to understand the answer to that question, you have to understand at least three attributes of God, and I'm going to go over those three attributes with you today. The first one is God is good. God is good. We've got to get that. We've got to understand that. And Psalms 119, 68 says, you are good, and what you do is good. Isn't that awesome? You are good, and what you do is good. Psalms 86, 5 says, you, Lord, our forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on you. To all who call on you. Is that not inclusive? That's inclusive. Anyone can call out to God. And he hears them. And he will answer them. Lord, our forgiving and good. You are forgiving and good, abounding in love. I love that. So, before we go too much farther, I want to break down the fact that we use words in three basic ways, okay? And they have, they have uh, real technical terms for them. I'm not going to get into that. One, the first way that we use a word is a word that only has one definition. So you can use a word that it literally only has one definition. However you say it, it has this one meaning. Another hand, on the other hand, there are words that... They're spelled the same, but they have two different meanings. Isn't that confusing? Thank you, English language. I don't know if any other languages have that, but I know we have that. And so since we all speak English in here, um, this falls under that category. So you can, you can have a word that's literally spelled this way, but it has two different meanings. Mind-blowing. But it'll, it will help you to understand a little bit where I'm going with this here in a minute. Or you can use an analogy it's a word to describe something else. Isn't that interesting? You can use an analogy, a totally different word to describe a totally different word. That's fine, but we're going to get into it. So God is good, but there are different levels of good. So if I'm saying that God is good, we think there's, there's so many different things that you can think that some food tastes good, that smells good. You know, I'm good at something, or you're good at something. So, the fact is, like, I was thinking of an analogy for you, and I don't know if any of you have ever seen um, American Sniper. You've ever heard of Chris Kyle, um, phenomenal um, military sniper, uh, or Carlos Hathcock. He was the Marine Corps' best sniper, or had the most kills anyway. So, 
if you, if you ran into one of these guys and you saw that, you know, they had their rifle bag with them or something like that, and you're like, hey, what are you doing? He's like, I'm a sniper. Um, you'd be like, oh, are you a good shot? You know? And Chris Kyle, God rest his soul, he would probably say, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty good shot. You know, I mean, he's, he's going to be a humble dude because capability breeds humility. It just does. So he would probably be like, I'm a pretty good shot. If you said, well, you should go shoot with my friend Nathan sometime. He's a good shot too. No, no you'd be totally wrong because these are two totally different types of good. I might be a good shot, but you put me up with Chris Kyle. There's not, there's not a comparison, not a comparison whatsoever. So do you see how you can use one word, the word good, and you use the word good over here, the same word, but it's totally different. It's totally different. I'm telling you that, that these two different levels of good, they're not the same at all. So whenever I say God is good, he is so much better than anything that we could possibly think or fathom. You've never heard of something that is as good as God. There's no comparison that you can make where you can say, God is good like such and such. No, 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 no. God is so much better than steak. He's so much better than chocolate. He's so much better than anything that you could possibly fathom. You can't put him in the same category. So to use the word good in, in describing God, it's just, it's what I have to be able to use, you know? It doesn't come close. It doesn't scratch the surface of how good God really is, though. So, number two, point number two. Um, so I told you that there's three attributes. This is attribute number two. God is just. He is a just God. Just is kind of another word for fair. He's righteous. He's just. He is a just God. Psalm 711 says, God is a righteous judge. He is a righteous judge. So a couple weeks ago, I hit a little bit on, on uh, hide and seek, right? And how, how some people may say that, that they feel like that God um, is hiding himself from them. But the fact of the matter is God doesn't hide himself from us. God seeks us out. And in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, the very first sin caused Adam and Eve to, to feel like that they weren't they weren't worthy, so they went and they hid themselves. God didn't hide himself from them whenever they sinned. What did God do? He sought them out. He sought them. He was walking through the garden, and he's calling for them. He's seeking them out, and he does the very same thing with us. He does the absolute very same thing with us. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. Most of you know Jeremiah 29, 11, but we stop we kind of stop after that 11 for whatever reason. But whenever we continue to read on, there's so much good stuff there. So let me read it to you. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. God, this is God speaking. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. They're plans for your welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then we go on to 12. <clears throat> then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me, and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. God is saying, all you got to do is come and look. All you got to do is seek. All you got to do is call on me, and I will be found by you. This is his promise. It's right here in his word. You seek him, you're going to find him. He's not hiding himself from you. He is a just God. He is a good God. Deuteronomy 4, <clears throat> 29. Sorry, let me grab a drink real quick. You'd think my body would be used to speaking so much because I do talk a lot. But it's still not. So You will seek me and you will find me. Deuteronomy 4, 29. There are multiple places throughout the word where he says this. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me will find me. It's all over the word. It's all over the word. If you're seeking God, he's going to find you. But he also seeks us out. He seeks us out. 
So, <clears throat> God would not be a just or fair, like I said, just and fair. He would not be a just God if he didn't give everyone a chance to be saved. I told you I was going to come back and hit on this. Because of his goodness, he reveals himself to everyone. Because of his goodness, he reveals himself to everyone. Pre-Jesus, even. And I'll give you a couple scriptures to, to point it out. So, you're thinking, what about the people that lived before Jesus or didn't get to hear about him? 1 Samuel 2 27 says, did I not clearly reveal myself to your father? Psalms uh, 98 two says, he made himself known and revealed himself in the sight of the nations. He made himself known and revealed himself in the sight of the nations. He was making himself known to everyone. If you think about the Israelites, whenever they're in Egypt, and God brought Moses, Right? And he's doing all these different signs and wonders and works. He revealed himself to the Israelites, right? In all these different ways. But he also revealed himself to the Egyptians. They also saw these things. They also the, saw the power of the Most High God. They got to view those things as well. So, some of you have heard me talk about my friend Kamal Salim before. And he's a former Muslim terrorist. And so I just, I want to use his example as an example of how God reveals himself to people. If you know anything about the, um, uh, the is Islamic religion right now, people that are uh, in the religion of Islam, God is, Jesus is revealing himself to them in an in a amazing way. Like these people are having dreams. I just heard a story about a guy that had a dream about Jesus every single night for six years. A dream about Jesus every single night for six years. He was scared to say anything because his three brothers were all in the military. They were trained to kill without feeling, especially anybody that believed in Jesus. He went and finally told his mom that he was having these dreams. She told him, you got to get out of the country. If your brothers hear that you are having dreams of Jesus, they will kill you and they will kill you without feeling. So he left the country. That's not Kamal, but it's just another story that I heard. My friend Kamal, when he was young, he was seven years old whenever he started getting into um, this Islamic uh, radical training camps, and he was being trained up to kill Christians and um, kill infidels from a very, very, very young age. Well, he had encounter after encounter after encounter where when he's out on missions trying to kill Jews, trying to kill Christians, anybody that didn't believe in Allah... Jesus himself showed up and was rescuing him and moving him out of the line of fire. Multiple occasions this happened to him. He encountered Jesus in the person, in, in the physical form. He literally grabbed him, moved him, and told him it's going to be okay. I've got you. These are things, this is how Jesus is revealing himself. God wants us to go into all the nations and preach the gospel and make disciples and baptize and, and, and all this stuff, but if we can't get there, he's still going to get there. God's not in a box. God's not somebody that can't get his job done. He gets the job done. He reveals himself to everyone. He loves everyone so much. The word says that he wants no one to perish, not even one. Not even one. He doesn't want anybody to perish. And he's a good enough God that he's not going to not give them an opportunity. So, because he reveals himself to everyone, you will choose where you spend eternity. Every person will choose. Every person will choose where you spend eternity. He wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't be fair or just for God to give any of us a free will and then violate that free will by forcing his will on us. That wouldn't be fair, it wouldn't be just. But he is a fair and a just God. So he does give us a free will. He reveals himself and gives us a free will to be able to choose him. Joshua 24, 15 says, Choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's the stand that I've chosen. Because your free will, think about this, because of your free will, you can never say that God is rejecting me. But God can say, this person 
or that person is rejecting me. God can say that, but we can't say that. God's not rejecting any of us because the word says he loved the world so much that he already gave his son. He gave his son. He's not rejecting you. He's giving everything for you. We can reject him. He's not rejecting us. You can never say that. Now, C.S. Lewis made this, made this statement, and I just absolutely love it. He said, there are two kinds of people in this world. The person who bows their knee to God and says, your will be done. Or the person who refuses to bow their knee and God says, your will be done. I love that, man. I'm going to repeat it one more time. Maybe you missed it. There's two types of people in this world. The person that bows their knee and says, God, your will be done. Or the person that refuses to bow their knee and God says, your will be done. That's powerful, isn't it? Man, that's powerful. All right. So God is good. God is just. God is also love. God is love. This is the third point. He loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever will believe in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. So, God is a loving God. He sent His Son to fulfill the law, live the life that we couldn't live, die the death on the cross that we couldn't die so that whoever believes will have everlasting life. That is the epitome of love. The word says that greater love, nobody has greater love than someone that lays their life down for their friend. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He laid it down for me. He laid it down for all of you, everyone in here, everyone at the sound of my voice. He laid his life down for us. But there's different levels of love, just like there's different levels of good, right? Right? So you got good, and then you got good, really good. Well, there's different levels of love. Like, for instance, I love you guys. Brittany loves you guys. But God truly loves you more than we ever possibly could. I love Brittany. I really, 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 really love Brittany. But I don't love you guys like I love Brittany. But I, the word's the same, right? I do love you guys, but I don't love, love, love you guys, you know? So there's, there's different levels there, right? There's different levels. God is, he's, he is just so vast. He's so much more. His love is so perfect. It's absolutely perfect. So I heard this, I heard this phrase. It's an analogy. If I love you, and you reject it, then I'm sad because I've lost something. I love you, but you reject it, and I'm sad because I've lost something. When God loves you, and you reject His love, He's sad, but it's because you've lost something. Because you've lost something. He wants that relationship with you, but He hurts. When we hurt, and He knows that if we don't have that relationship with Him, we are going to hurt badly, very badly. That's why He's sad, because we've lost something. So, there's two times in the New Testament whenever the Word says that Jesus wept. One is whenever Lazarus died, right? And He's chilling, doing whatever He's doing, and then He finally shows up days later. Oh, my timer's going off. I'm going to start wrapping it up, probably. He shows up days later, and Mary and Martha are weeping. And Jesus wept. But think about why Jesus wept. Did he weep because he lost Lazarus? No. Jesus knows that he's getting ready to go to the cross anyway, and in a very short time, he's going to be right back with Lazarus. No big deal. No big deal at all. The Word says that he went and got the great cloud of witnesses, took them with him. So if Lazarus would have stayed in that grave, Jesus would have been picking him up in no time. He would have been there. He wasn't weeping because he lost Lazarus. 
That's, that's just simply not the case. He was weeping because Mary and Martha lost something and they were in pain. We don't, people are like, Jesus doesn't care. God doesn't care. Yes, he cares. He cares when you're in pain because he feels your pain. He does. And this proves it. This proves it. The second time was whenever he was on his way into Jerusalem for the last time that he would be entering Jerusalem. And he starts talking to them. And he says, Oh, Jerusalem, you've missed your visitation. His heart is breaking at this point. But listen to why. You've missed your visitation. He starts telling them about the fact that they killed the, they killed the prophets and all this. But then, then he gets down to the point. You've missed your visitation. You've waited forever for your Messiah. And your Messiah is right here. And you didn't believe. All these years. And now I'm here. I'm right here. He wept because they lost something. They lost an opportunity to be with him. To have that intimate, personal, loving relationship with him that he wanted so deeply. That they thought that they wanted, but then they rejected him. That's why Jesus wept. So he wept. His heart was broken for Mary and Martha and for all of Jerusalem whenever they refused to accept the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? That's a whole different kind of love, guys. It's a whole different kind of love. So in order to understand, in order to understand that God doesn't want to lose anyone, that he truly does give everybody an opportunity. We've got to understand that God is good, that God is just, and that God is love. All of that combined, you can see his heart. It's laid out for you. It's absolutely laid out for you. So, hear me today. God loves you. He loves you. He loves everyone. Because the word says that we're all created in his image and in his likeness. Isn't that amazing? Even people that we don't like, he likes. Sorry. Truth be told. You know, he does. That's why he said, I tell you, don't hate your enemies, but pray for your enemies. Pray for them. Because even the people that do the most horrible things, they can still be turned around. They can still be turned around. You know? God can soften their heart. He can make it pliable. He made mine pliable. He made yours pliable. You know, he can soften hearts. So, today I just want to, uh, I want to close by praying for, for everybody. If anybody in here or anybody watching online hasn't made God the Lord of their life, hasn't taken the opportunity to love the one that loves them more than anything else, then I want to I wanna make sure that you have that opportunity today. And I just want to pray with you. So you can just pray these words. Lord God, forgive me of my sins. I know that I've sinned, but I know that you are righteous and you can make me righteous. So forgive me of my sins, Lord. And I accept you into my life as my Lord. And I surrender my life to you from this moment forward. In 